it's uh, it's on. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Eric, for the for the introduction, and and thanks to all you know to Enthought and all the organizers and sponsors of the conference. Um, this is my I think it's fifth SciPy. I missed one in the middle. My first was in 2000 was in 2010, um, and I've been to uh, you know been to all but one since then, and, and they've um, so it's great to see the community grow. There are a lot more. Um, a lot more Python programmers, and also folks tackling a lot more diverse use cases than um, than we were, you know, five, you know, five, six years ago. So that's so that's really exciting. Exciting to see how um, how the language and the community and and the, and the software um, has grown to be, you know, useful in a lot more uh, a lot more areas of work. Um, and thanks also for getting up. I'm on Pacific time, so this is early for me. Um, so this time yesterday, I was I was sleeping. So I, I promise I'll watch Chris Wiggins' keynote. Um, I think if the video is probably already up, but uh, um, you, you know how that goes. So this is a, a little bit different than my normal talks, which are more like focused on pandas and specific details of you know pandas versus the rest of the you know data tools, other programming languages. Um, you know, I work at I work at Cloudera now, so my, my life is more about big data than, than it used to be. Um, but this is a bit more of a, a bit more of a retrospective on um, my own experiences, and um, you know maybe some thoughts on you know where we've been, where we're going, and uh, we can talk we can talk more about that. Maybe have some questions at the end. So I've I've been up to. Well, a lot of things. I, I guess these things just kind of happen as time passes that you, you know, move from one thing to another, or at least I did. Um, so I've been involved in a number of different, number of different Python projects. I've worked, worked in a number of different places, studied a couple of different places. Um, so you know, we'll talk, talk some more, um, more about those things. Uh, this is really you know, covering 2007 to the present, um, the things that I was up to, talk about how um, things have you know things have gone well, um, you know, which is really a testament to the to the community, and uh, talk a little bit uh, in brief about um, some of what I'm personally focused on right now and what I see as some of the opportunities for the community to continue to grow um, and, and flourish. So whenever you, you come to one of these conferences, it's it's. It is useful to look around at, at you know the people at the conference and say, well, you know, what brought you here? You know, how did you how did you end up here? And um, I know I often ask myself the, you know the same question, the you know the odd sequence of sequence sequence of events, um, kind of the butterfly effect. You know, if you could trace it back to you know how how could I end end up you know kind of on the stage at a you know scientific Python conference? Um, you know, back when I, I knew very little about Python, um, you know, eight years ago. And so, and I think the common thread that brings us all here is that Python is helping us solve our problems. Um, you know, some folks here are core developers on on many of the projects that you use um, every day. You know, um, the Pandas core team. A lot of them are here. Jeff Reback, who's the the project leader. Um, Philip Cloud. You know, St Stefan Hoyer, who's building kind of a um, not exactly an offshoot project of Pandas, but a reimagining of Pandas for more. Um, for climate data and you know um, sort of a different set of use cases, but definitely sort of stemming off of the the experience offered by um, by pandas. There's a lot of the NumPy core team is here. Um, you know, people who built people who built NumPy, people who built SciPy. So it's really exciting to bring together people from industry who are using Python, learning more about Python, how to use Python more to solve their problems, along with the people who are building the software. Um, it's incredibly important that we bring those two groups of people together so that if you're just using the Python data stack, the scientific Python stack, on a day-to-day -day basis, that you can tell the core developers about you know, what's working well, what's not working well, um, what, you know, if you ran into a problem where you ended up down a rabbit hole and had to spend three months building some custom solution to fit your problem, um, that can often you know, speak to a limitation in the tool set. And telling those stories to the, to the folks who are you know, at least part or full time working on the open source software is incredibly useful. Um, and none of the software that we have here would exist if not for, for those use cases and those real world, real world applications. So before, you know, I started programming in Python uh, in 2007, 2008, I really wasn't much of a programmer. Um, I got a math degree and I didn't do a lot of programming in college. 
And so, you know, people talk to me now and they're like, Wes, what happened? Like you were writing proofs in 2006 and now you're, now you're uh, you know, mostly writing Python code. Um, it was mostly, I think, in retrospect, a, a matter of exposure that I'd never really seen Python programming, I didn't know any Python, um, didn't really know any Python programmers. Um, you know, the, the, one, the one anecdote that I had about Python is I was taking um, the intro algorithms course at, at MIT and we had a, a dynamic programming problem uh, on one of the problem sets and um, I, because I'd taken a Java course and so I wrote the solution in Java and it was like, you know, a couple hundred, you know, lines of Java at the end of the day. It wasn't, you know, a, a very complex um, dynamic programming problem. And a friend of mine, um, um, a friend of mine said to me, she said, well, um, I'm going to write the solution in Python and I bet you it doesn't exceed 30 lines. And, you know, I just said, that's just crazy. I mean, clearly, like, there's no way that the solution to the problem can be that short. Um, and one of the TAs published a solution to the problem in Python and I said, wow, this is, this is crazy. It's so short. Like, I, you know, it, this was in 2005, I think, and it just didn't really click with me at, at that point. And uh, I continued onward writing proofs and um, getting a math degree. I also had no exposure to, to any data analysis or analytics uh, really of any kind, so I'd never written a SQL query. Um, I didn't know what R was. I actually never heard of R until I, I was working at, at AQR. Um, so I was kind of within this like very like sheltered bubble of, um, um, you know, of, of technology and, and science uh, when, I was at, when I was at MIT. So, um, you know, let, let's just say that joining industry was, was a bit of a rude awakening. Um, I got a job at AQR, um, which stands for Applied Quantitative Research. Uh, so if you follow the hedge fund industry, AQR was started by uh, Cliff Asnes, who um, was one of uh, Eugene Fama's um, grad students at the University of Chicago. So Eugene Fama, I, th I don't know that he's won the Nobel Prize yet, but he's always on the short list uh, for, the, for the economics Nobel Prize for the efficient market hypothesis. But I think that the efficient market hypothesis is a bit you know, on, on the down, down these, these days, um, since a lot of, you know, I think it's more for like political reasons than, um, than anything. But they were at Goldman Sachs. They, they, they were running the, the hedge fund operation at Goldman. They spun out in 1998 um, started AQR. Nine, eight, eight, eight or nine years later, um, I got a job there because there were, a lot of, um, there were a lot of math folks who had gotten jobs there, and I was looking for, well, applications of math. And so I, I uh, got a job at a, at a quant fund. Um, but it was, it was an interesting environment um, as you know, while there was a lot of math and a lot of, a lot of research involved with the, with the asset management process, the whole company really, you know, at its core ran on, ran on SQL and Excel. And I'd hardly used Excel at that point, so that was also a bit of a, um, a, bit of a trial. Um, the systems that built the models and ran all of the, um, you know, computed the, you know, the buy-sell orders were all written, um, you know, in C++ and Java. Um, you know, there was development in all of the, you know, standard compiled programming languages that we all know. Um, there were a number of folks who'd come from economics departments who had PhDs, and in PhD, you know, economics and finance departments, even today, are still very much um, about MATLAB and R, and, and depending on the department, it'll either be more MATLAB or more R. I think that's beginning to change and you're seeing more Python, but at least at that time, um, the, um, you know, the message was, you know, if you're going to do some research not in C++, um, then, you should, then you should use MATLAB. So I had a bunch of projects my, my first year that, that involved, um, some of them were more analytics that were more about summarizing data that was, that was found in, um, you know, all of our data was in a Microsoft SQL database. So you would pull data out of the, you know, your workflow would either be do all of your data analysis in the SQL database, which you would end up with, you know, 100, you know, 300 line SQL queries, or you would pull some of the data out, you would write a simpler SQL query, you would pull the data out and then either analyze it, usually in Excel, um, but if you were using MATLAB and you could, you know, analyze the data in MATLAB. Um, the group that I was in had, um, had someone who with, with our experience and so that, that team, um, a credit derivatives team was doing a lot of R programming and so I was introduced at that time to this very strange programming language R, um, which at that time was quite a, quite a lot different than it is now. Um, and kind of surrounding all of this was, was huge amounts of Excel. 
So, you know, if you didn't sort of mechanically end up with all of the Excel shortcuts in, in your hands, you know, after a year or so, you just weren't getting very much done because most of your life was moving data around in Excel, um, you know, copy and pasting special values and, and all that sort of thing. Um, but the thing that really, that really jumped out at me is that I, I, I felt like I was spending a lot of my time dealing with just data munging, moving data around, um, cleaning data, um, normalizing it, you know, lining up, lining up data in spreadsheets. And, you know, these were data analysis projects that were, that could be discussed, you know, in a half hour meeting where they weren't, they weren't really very complex and the details of, you know, what data is coming from where and what do we need to do with it and what are the deliverables for the project. Um, they were very easy to talk about, but actually getting them done was a whole lot of work. Um, and so that was, you know, I think this whole, you know, formative experience kind of imbued me with this sort of allergy to any, anything, that, uh, anything that, that harms productivity or that prevents you from expressing your ideas in a concise way so that you can, you know, hopefully your code will keep up with your thought process about the problem um, as much as possible, although that rarely, that rarely occurs, but um, certainly it should be better than 95.5. I mean, maybe it should be like 80-20 would be, would, be uh, would be a better situation. Um, and so I, I had gotten exposed to Python. Um, one of my colleagues had, had written a couple scripts for, um, you know, for, you know, odd jobs. You know, nothing really, um, no scientific Python, like nothing really, um, nothing heavy duty. But I, I had gotten introduced to the language and it was very alluring because it's like, wow, it's like readable pseudocode, you know, the, the same thing that I'm sure brought a lot of people uh, in this room to, to Python in, in the first place. Um, and I discovered at the beginning of 2008, like, wow, there's this whole numeric and scientific computing community who are, um, you know, solving research problems and doing fast numerics in this interpreted programming language that's really easy to write. Um, but it was, it was a very different time. So, you know, you look at today, we have very mature tool sets, um, you know, projects that have been around for you know, more than, more than 10 years. Um, NumPy is going to have its 10th birthday next year. Um, you know, SciPy is getting on, you know, might be about 15 years old or so at this point. Um, you know, Matplotlib's been around since 2002, I think. Um, IPython around the same time. Um, you know, all these projects have, you know, they've been around for a long time, but if you fast forward, or if you go back in time to 2008, you know, these, this, was, this was bleeding edge stuff. And, you know, you have to remember, I was in a financial firm where, um, you know, as we used to say, you know, you're short a put option. So if you use a piece of software and it ends up, like, causing bugs that are not your fault, it's like, oh, well, there were bugs in this open source software that I was using. You know, y y it was pretty clear, like, it wasn't, you know, explicitly said, but you're like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get fired. Um, <laughs> Because you know, blaming the open source developers is like not a valid, uh, not not a valid excuse, um, <laughs> and 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 that was part of what drove the the use of um, you know tools that came from Microsoft or that came from you know the MathWorks you know with MATLAB, um, is that there was this this you know and you can understand like we were managing build you know billions of dollars, you know at that point you know AQR had forty billion dollars under management. Um, nowadays, it has well over a hundred billion dollars under management. So there's this. You can understand the risk aversion that if you lose your client's money, like you know, your head's on the chopping block, quite literally. Um, and so you can imagine kind of the um, the apprehension that that was experienced when I uh, started telling my colleagues, like, hey, let's let's start um, doing all of our work um, in in Python. It will make us all a lot more productive. Um, I think people worry first about you know what's the downside risk here. Um, the community w w was also a lot different at that point, um, and I don't, you know, this is not really tr this is not really true anymore. But at that point, the the battle was quite a lot different. The battle was being waged in scientific research. It's, you were doing your PhD, and you're telling your advisor, "I'm going to do this work in with you know Python and NumPy and SciPy, um, and I'm instead of instead of MATLAB." Um, and so, a lot of the work in the community was about um, and I think you know, maybe part of it was that a lot of the core developers were PhD students procrastinating on finishing their PhDs. Um, that's, you know, that's you know, another story. But, uh, you know, but that was really where, where the focus was. And when I um, you know, came upon the community, 
um, you know, I, I saw that. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Like, clear, and I, because I had MATLAB users uh, at AQR, so I was like, well, it'd be great. I didn't want to program in MATLAB, and so, um, you know, the prospect of, uh, you know, having an alternative to MATLAB, at least, was, uh, was really exciting. Um, but in, in my case, you know, very different, very different use cases, and, and so all of, pretty much all of the things that um, were most relevant at, at, at a core, like the things that were going to solve the problems I had were not core concerns of the, of the community. Um, I hadn't written any SQL, you know, before I got to AQR, suddenly I'm, you know, my whole world is writing SQL queries and I'm spending 40% of my day in uh, SQL Server Management Studio. Um, but, you know, if you look at the proceedings of SciPy, you know, the conference talks and the papers, there really wasn't, there weren't a lot of relational databases, not a lot of SQL was getting written. Um, and as a res and, and that kind of trickled down to all of the other related problems around, you know, how do you deal with nulls and missing data. Um, using Python for statistical use cases, if you looked at statistics departments, uh, at that time, it was more about um, statistics departments were, were fighting to use R instead of Stata and commercial um, statistics, you know, really SAS and Stata uh, using R as an open source alternative to those, um, to those tools. And you had this chicken and egg problem where there were no statistical tools or very few statistical tools in, in Python, um, very few statistical tools, and, and as a result, not, not very many people were using it for statistical applications. Um, and then kind of, you know, your downstream use cases, making graphics that are statistical in nature, um, you know, machine learning. So a lot of the things that we kind of take for granted now didn't really, didn't really exist. Um, and the work that I was doing kind of fell into this last category of more, you know, unfortunately analytics has this, you know, buzzwordy connotation, means all sorts of things. But, um, you know, analytics in a lot of business settings means things that you can do with SQL. And, but you would like to write Python code instead of, instead of SQL. Um, but that was not really a thing that you could, you could do well at that, at that time. So, and, you know, also taking in context that I was, you know, 20, you know, let's see, beginning of 2008, so I was almost 23 years old and incredibly stubborn, and, um, and I guess I didn't care that much about getting fired. I'm like, well, if I get fired over this, it'll make a really good story. Um, and, uh, and I, was, I was doing an R project, and I'd seen that um, a professor named Jonathan Taylor um, at Stanford had ported um, a select subset of, of an important R package to, um, to Python, and that, that's the MASS um, package. And so in particular, I needed, um, ne needed an algorithm called iteratively reweighted least squares. Say that three times fast on a, up here on a podium. Um, also known as a robust linear model for doing the project that I was doing. And, um, and the thing about SciPy stats models is that it wasn't even in mainline SciPy. So I found it in the SVN repo. I think it was in a branch. I don't, I don't It might have been in trunk. Maybe it was in a branch. But it hadn't been, it hadn't been shipped in SciPy. So this was like seriously bleeding edge stuff. But I said, well, it implements my model. I, I fitted the model. And I was like, oh, it matches the R results, you know, Yahtzee, like we can, I can maybe use this. Um, I just won't tell anyone that it's, you know, bleeding edge stuff that hasn't been released. Um, and so that, that, was, that was, you know, if, if you go back to like what was the, the hook that, that gave me a reason to really try this out seriously, it was really, it was really that. Um, and the funny thing is, you know, Jonathan Taylor is, uh, you know, is a statistics professor and he was embedded in Stanford, which was very much, um, you know, MATLAB and R at that time, um, and still is, if you, you know, if, um, in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, you know, I think he was he was drawn to Python, you know, as were as were as were we all. Um, and so, if not for that, like I don't, you know, it's like the butterfly, you know, I don't know how things might be different. I think I might still be programming in R, although quite a lot less happy. Um, so I, um, in order to really use that library well, uh, I needed a, some kind of, of data structure or you know, data wrangling you know, toolkit. Um, you know, I had no idea like, what was going to be the scope of the project. I had just the problem that was sitting in front of me. 
and I had a, a whole you know, big bag of frustrations from using R um, and use, working with time series data, dealing with data from many different tables, you know, doing all that munging, joining, aligning, normalization, missing value handling, forward filling, all that stuff uh, was very difficult to do in R at that time. Uh, it's gotten, gotten easier in the meantime. But those were the problems I had. It was financial data, and so I tried to port my R code to Python. And um, so about a month later, you know, the you know, proto pandas kind of, you know, thousand lines of code, you know, kind of, as Fernando Perez would say, like just an afternoon hack, um, had turned into a, a, you know, a, some, a useful tool for the particular problems I was working on. And, um, you know, the interesting thing that happened at AQR is that we, we had a case where we needed to, to implement a statistical model in production. Um, and doing it in C++ was going to take a really long time, you know, because, because C++. Um, and so we found with, with a little bit of research that we could actually embed the Python interpreter and enable, um, enable users to write uh, analytics in, or statistical computations in Python and extend the legacy system with, with Python instead of with C++. Um, and it's funny to kind of think back on that project and how like hackish and horrible it was in some ways. Um, you know, we just had to get something running as a proof of concept. Um, but it was this kind of, it was this amazing thing where, you know, it was like a Trojan horse that we, you know, quite literally like opened up inside of this legacy system and then all of a sudden um, people realized that they can write Python instead of C++. And well, you can imagine what happened. Everyone wants to write a lot of Python. Um, Getting Python adopted, you know, in a $40 billion asset management business, um, you know, overnight is certainly not a thing that happens. Um, so a lot of the work that, 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 that occurred over the next year was, you know, building consensus around, um, you know, can we use Python in a serious way? Um, can we trust it? You know, are the, um, you know, can we trust the open source community? You know, who are these people that are building this software? You know, those are all the discussions um, that we had. And at a certain point, and you know, there was a lot of skunk works, you know, porting existing systems to Python as proofs of concept, concepts, um, you know, getting folks to use proto, you know, what I call proto pandas. It, it wasn't called pandas at this point. It had it had it had no name actually. It was just the AQR time series library. So there was a lot of evangelism around, like, you know, don't do Ruby, don't do MATLAB, you know, consider Python. Look at this cool uh, time series tool that. Um, you know, that I'm building. So, you know, long story short, we, um, you know, by beginning of 2009, we decided to make um, a serious commitment to Python and see, see how it goes. Um, I'm sure that there was always, you know, an escape hatch, you know, we'll escape to, to Java um, if Python doesn't work out. Um, but it did, and it was certainly a lot of work, and the things that, 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 made, it, that made it easier and made it possible, um, one, one of the big ones is that we didn't have to re-implement um, or implement any, you know, core, any core system components. Um, so we were able to reuse, in, you know, essentially, you know, pick and choose components of the scientific Python ecosystem, things like, you know, pi tables, you know, HTF5, you know, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, IPython. Those formed like the foundation of an interactive research environment, and the thing that was missing was the domain-specific functionality, the data wrangling, the time series support, um, the things that you needed to um, to build, um, you know, um, you know, quantitative models for for trading. <clears throat> the other big thing was was the interoperability, and you know, of course, that's a big reason why we're all here, is because it would have been a fool's errand in the late '90s to go and re-implement. Um, all of the kind of legacy, you know, legacy code bases that were written in C, C++, and Fortran, you can just bring them with you and script them from, um, script them from Python, you know, build a nice wrapper layer. Um, and the fact that we were both able to embed Python in a legacy system, that was kind of the step one, and also take legacy components um, as we would sort of cut away parts that had been re-implemented in Python, we could wrap those C++ components in Python C extensions so that systems that just didn't make sense to go and re-implement or there was just no, um, there was no bandwidth to, to port those, um, any, you know, either no bandwidth or it might have been a legacy system 
that was maybe, you know, maybe we'll de decommission this in a few years, um, we could just wrap those in Python just. I mean, it was a lot of work, but um, it was certainly easier than the alternative, you know, having to more or less throw out a trusted system that had been developed over the course of 10 years. Um, and the, and the, the other big thing was the fact that the user interface was so much more, so much more pleasant and, and palatable um, for, for the users. And, and I think that you know, when new people come to, to the Python ecosystem, that's often like one of the big revelations. Um, you, know, you, you learn the libraries, you learn IPython, you know, the basic tools. You know, IPython notebook didn't ex didn't exist back then, but you know, I think even you know now when people discover the IPython notebook, they're like, "Wow, how did I get on in life without without this?" Um, it's like life was so horrible before. It's like you realize, you know, you've been sort of, you know, walking, you know, walking uphill both ways, and uh, you know, eating dog food and all those sorts of things, and you know, and you've got like a motorbike, and you know, you've got filet mignon, and like you know, life's just really great. You know, um, <laughs> you can spend more time reading the internet. Uh, and so, you know, I think, you know, from that point onward, um, you know, the, the, the approach to problems, you know, would be, you know, you encounter a new problem, be like, well, can we use Python to solve the problem? And I think that the, you know, our community is, is very much the same way that, you know, if you, and, and, and you hope kind of in your companies and, you know, in any software project that, you know, you should have a really good reason to not be using Python. Um, and, it's, and it's great that, that this is now considered uh, a popular belief that, um, that Python is the first thing that you reach for, try to solve problems with, um, try to solve problems with it first, um, and have a really good reason to be, you know, programming in Java or C++. Um, so, <clears throat> So um, after, after a period of time um, and a lot of convincing, so I think Eric alluded to that, it took, it, you know, financial institutions don't like to open source code, just as like a matter of principle, because um, any IP is considered to, be, um, considered to be precious. And, you know, I made the argument that, um, that open sourcing would be a really positive thing for, for the company, for recruiting, um, for, you know, getting community, community development and involvement in, in the project. Um, and it's interesting how that played out, and if I have time, maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. But so I looked, I downloaded. It's on PyPI, and you can download Pandas point one, and it's really small. Like it, it, you think about Pandas point sixteen point two now, which weighs in at you know a little under two hundred thousand lines of code, um, and the first version of Pandas was a really small project. There was a little bit of Cython for accelerating. Um, certain, you know, certain algorithms, um, but it's a really small library, um, and, you know, it certainly wasn't the package that, that, that it is today, and it was only useful for a certain small set of use cases. <clears throat> and, um, you know, and I was busy with other things, and so at the time when, uh, when we open sourced, we open sourced Pandas, developing Pandas was not our main priority. It was suitable for our needs. It had pretty much everything that we needed. And so, you know, spending a lot of, you know, a lot of time, you know, moving pandas forward wasn't really, wasn't really a priority. Um, and, you know, in, in 2010 and 2011, um, there was just starting to develop, you know, the first kind of, you know, whispers of like a statistical community in Python. So, you know, Skipper Siebold, who's, who's here, um, you know, one of the core developers of the Stats Models Project, um, the first ver major version of Stats Models came out of his, uh, he was a Google Summer of Code student in 2011, um, and that was the first version of Stats Models. But, you know, you go back to 2010 and there was no consensus about, you know, if you need to do data wrangling or analytics, like, what should you use? And, you know, Pandas was this little known thing that, had, that sat there that wasn't, you know, it was useful, but not as useful as it is today. Um, I went to grad school. Um, AQR, I, I consulted with AQR while I was in grad school, mostly to fix bugs and add a few new features to, to Pandas, but the, you know, the real story of Pandas didn't really get started until the summer of um, 2011, and there, there were two discrete events that, that occurred um, that led me to get really worked up, for the la lack of a better uh, term. So the first is that um, I think that it, among kind of the, 
you know, sort of literati and the you know core scientific Python developers, the the perception that there was some lack of consensus around data structures and, and data toolkits for uh, for statistical computing in Python, I think it, that was acknowledged that it was an issue and that we should talk about it and figure out like a, to build some consensus and figure out a way forward. Um, and thought had us um, you know flew us all in. We met for a couple of days to talk about talk about this problem and figure out how we can solve the architectural issues, um, low level issues with NumPy that were preventing um, NumPy from being used w better, more for statistical computing. Um, you know what's up with the data structures, um, and you know my big argument at at, at this time was that um, you know rather than having this this federation of loosely connected components that that we needed to build something that was more, more integrated and delivered a better user experience to the end statistical user who's not a computer scientist that just wants to be able to you know, import a library and read a CSV file and compute some statistics about it. Um, and you have to remember that at that point in time, even simple things like reading CSV files were still very hard. Um, and so I was very, you know, I'd gotten more interested in the problem. You know, I was a grad student, didn't have a lot of time for open source development, but you know that was a big thing. Um, and then I, I went and um, had uh, spent a couple of weeks working with a, um, a hedge fund that was not AQR and a consulting consulting engagement. Um, and I spent a couple of weeks with them, and I realized that um, that it, that the problems that we had at AQR were not not isolated to AQR. I think at that time I had invented this fantasy that every company had built better software than we had, and it turned out that it was quite the opposite, that, that a lot of um, companies uh, were still kind of you know, back in the dark ages in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and that wasn't necessarily true of, uh, of the particular company I was working with, but you know, I think I heard stories about you know, the general financial industry and hearing about you know, other companies. Um, and you know, it felt like it was the time for Python data tools and you know, we need to do something about this. So. Um, but the issue was maturity, and um, and again, the chicken and egg problem. And so it was like the end of May 2011, or I guess I, I decided that you know someone has to be the chicken, and it might as well be me. Um, and uh, and I think you know when you're building community and you're building a software, you know the use cases and and the and the real world applications are you know are the most important thing, and you can't. You can't build a useful piece of software unless you're being faced, you know, at least in a nearly direct way, like you have a consulting project or um, you're working in some direct way with somebody who's suffering from a problem so that, you know, you can ship a piece of software and then say, well, did that solve your problem? Did that solve your problem? And if it didn't, then you have this sort of virtuous cycle of making the software better until you're really completely, you know, uh, solving the, um, the, the use case. Um, during the latter half of, of, of 2011, I, I worked with AppNexus in, in New York. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that, you know, in these consulting agreements, they're like, you may not talk about, you know, um, AppNexus, big Python shop. And um, they, um, that was a very enlightening time for me um, because it was a set of analytics and, and data challenges that was pretty far afield of what I'd encountered at AQR. And I very quickly realized, like, wow, we need to make Pandas more or less a SQL replacement as much as possible. And there was just a heck of a lot of stuff that was missing from the library. And I would come home from a day at AppNexus with, like, this, you know, long list of, like, these are all the things that need to get built in, in Pandas. And then I would, you know, it would be, like, 5 or 6 p.m. And then I would work from, like, 6 p.m. until 1 or 2 in the morning. And then I would wake up and do it all over again. Um, and so the next you know year and a half um, pretty much worked like worked like that, um, you know, making pandas better, um, you know, evangelizing, you know, building consensus in the community, um, building functionality that you really couldn't find anywhere else that would also attract users um, from other communities. So like the time series capabilities in in pandas um, still are you know among the very best. Uh, and that was a, a draw for our, our folks, you know, for, you know, really any programming language to say, wow, this is this amazing 
uh, time series tool that also can be used for general um, relational data operations. Like we don't have to put the data in a database to do an outer join. Um, so something I, I will mention is that part of the reason that, that this was all possible was that I, I found myself in, you know, it was, it was May 2011 and I got really fired up and I, and I went to my advisor at Duke and I said, I have to take leave so I can work on software. And so I took a year off from grad school um, and I moved back to New York and you know, the reason that I made, you know, in retrospect, it seemed it was a little crazy. Um, part of the reason I was able to do all this was that I had been very frugal when I worked in finance, and I'd saved up just about enough money um, where I was like, well, I can work on open source for about a year, but then I'm going to have to, you know, figure my life out and how to, you know, support this uh, in, a, in a sustainable way. Um, but I was, I was willing to go broke over it. Like, it, it was that important to me. And I was like, well, I saved this money, and like, what better, you know, like, I might as well spend it on this because it feels like the thing that, um, that is needed right now. Um, I got a book deal with O'Reilly, November 2011. Um, I hope to talk a little bit more about the backstory, but there's other things I, I wanted to talk about. Needless to say, it's been very successful. Um, I think a lot of you here probably own copies of the book, and I certainly never expected it to be, uh, be so successful. Um, you know, Fernando, Brian, and John had been, um, you know, putting together different book drafts in the past, and we talked about working together on a book, but, um, you know, they were very busy, um, I had the time, and I wanted to make a more, like, pandas-focused book, and I, I honestly used writing the book as a way to, it was like the carrot to make me finish parts of pandas, I was like, well, here's an empty section of the book, um, I want to put something there, so I'd better finish the software. Um, you know, with, with any project, um, it's not just about, you know, sitting down and, you know, hacking out a bunch of code. You really have to have clarity about what it is that you're building, what are the problems that you're solving, um, and being, you know, faced with those real use cases uh, is, is the thing that will help you kind of get, get there, um, you know, the most quickly. Um, and I had a lot of support along the way. You know, I wasn't working in a bubble. Um, you know, there were constant, you know, conversations with, folks in the community on the mailing lists, you know, at SciPy, um, you know, a lot of, uh, it was a lot of discussion and collaboration, and, and honestly, the folks on this list, and this is not the com complete list, but, you know, uh, folks here at Enthought, you know, Eric and Travis and, and Peter, um, the IPython folks and the stats models folks, you know, they were all cheering me on, and so, you know, without their support and, uh, you know, um, that, without their use cases and their support, um, it would have been really hard for me to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to do all this. And certainly, being that lone wolf that's kind of, you know, in the cave, you know, writing the code, you know, the real world is not like that. Like you have to engage with others and uh, and learn about the problems that other uh, that other people are face facing. So just to relay a little a little anecdote, just to to show you how small the world is, um, and uh, how how you know, I guess serendipity does in fact occur. I was on a train from Seattle to Portland in November 2011, and I had just been in, um, I had just been in Seattle, and had spent, you know, at the supercomputing conference, and had spent a, a few days, um, you know, hanging out with and talking about data with Peter Wang, um, and the guy sitting next to me sees that I'm in Emacs and says, "Well, are you a programmer?" I said, "Well, yes, I'm a Python programmer," and he says, "Oh, I do a little bit of Python too." And I said, oh, well, have you seen the IPython notebook? Which at this point was very beta software. So it turns out that I was sitting next to Titus Brown, um, who if you don't know is, uh, is a huge Pythonista and uh, has been at SciPy many times, um, is in the PSF and a uh, you know, huge proponent of Python and uses Python in his research lab for, um, I believe he's at UC Irvine now. Um, and, and as fate would have it, um, I'm, I'm informed that, that he was very helpful in, in helping the IPython team get their first um, dedicated funding for IPython in, in 2012. Um, and Fernando claims that, that a part of that was sort of the, that, you know, um, that I think after that conversation with Titus, he became a huge uh, convert and proponent of the IPython notebook. Um, so, uh, John Hunter, who's, you know, unfortunately not with us, um, you know, was a big, 
um, was also a big part of, of helping me along the way. Um, you know, part of the reason why you know I'll, I'll, I'll single out John Hunter is he was um, you know after after Eric Jones, John was one of the first people from the Python community um, that I met, and the reason was that in January 2010. Um, I wasn't sure what I was doing with myself. I was like, maybe I'll go to grad school, maybe I'll get another job, I don't really know. Um, I wanted to sort of move on to some new project. And uh, I saw that, that Tradeworks in Chicago, where John worked, uh, was looking for Python developers. I said, oh, a finance company that you know has been using Python for years. And, um, and so I flew to Chicago and uh, I interviewed at Tradeworks and I you know, spent uh, quite a long time with John and, and you know, he and I, um, you know, bonded right away, and I, I think that maybe John saw me as like a, you know, 17 year younger, um, you know, sort of, you know, version of himself in, in, in a certain way. And when you go back to the origin story of, of Matplotlib, um, you know, John was very much kind of the lone wolf programmer, you know, sort of, I'm going to build a plotting replacement so that my research lab doesn't have to use Matlab anymore. Um, and I certainly I identified with that. Um, and John was often a person that I, you know, I would email or like get on the phone with whenever I, you know, sort of needed to discuss like community issues or, you know, like oh this is really hard, like you know how to make how to make the you know open source lifestyle uh, su sustainable. And um, you know, one of the things that I faced in in the in the Python community was the pressure to not work on pandas, but to instead work on other components like NumPy. Um, rather than build kind of pandas, which was viewed at that time to be kind of working around limitations in NumPy, um, to just work on NumPy and fix the kind of you know limitations of NumPy rather than building this sort of you know um, other project, and um, and so John I think was kind of the, the loudest voice that was like, well, forge your own path if you need to do your own thing, like don't worry about it, like it'll all sort itself out, and as long as the software that you're building is useful. Um, and so it was good that I had somebody, uh, somebody telling me that, and uh, you know, couldn't have been you know uh, a more empathetic person than uh, than John. So for everyone who knows him, um, I started a couple of business ventures uh, during 2012 while I was writing my book. Um, we uh, we explored building a, a commercial Python financial toolkit. Um, so one of the things I realized during that time is that selling Python software is hard. Um, and maybe as a result, I've, I've developed a very strong feeling that, that the software needs to be free and it needs to be open source. Um, and so you know, I haven't been as interested in building um, commercial uh, scientific software you know, as a result. Um, and that was a large reason that, uh, that, that Chung and I started, started Datapad and said, well, we're not building software for Python users, but we're going to move upstack into the business user build a business intelligence tool that solves problems that, um, that, we, that, that exist out there and still exist, um, but use the Python stack as our core, our core, technology, um, core technology for building, uh, for building the product. Um, so starting companies is hard. I don't need to tell, um, I don't need to tell many of you. Um, you know, we, uh, we were venture backed and uh, we built, built a product, built a company, and we had kind of, you know, I knew the Cloudera founders, and, um, you know, we'd been, you know, talking about the product for, um, you know, for a very long time, and, you know, selling to Cloudera customers would have been, you know, one of our, um, you know, one of our go-to-market strategies. Um, but the, the back end, like the systems engineering problems that we were tackling were very similar to the problems at Cloudera, and, you know, last summer, you know, um, they said, hey, you know, why don't we join forces and, and solve these problems together? And that is that is indeed what uh, what, what occurred. So um, so where I am now and what I'm doing, um, Cloudera, I guess you can think of as you know an open source company for for big data um, that builds and supports uh, Hadoop and projects that uh, you know are related to Hadoop and the, the the Hadoop distributed file system. And and for me, you know, kind of thinking about like the arc of my life and and wanting to have a way to sustainably work uh, full time on open source. Um, I really couldn't ask for, for a better, uh, you know, for a better situation um, and, and to be working on, on data problems at, at, at very large scale. Um, so I'm happy to talk more offline with other folks about, you know, my work there and, uh, you know, Cloudera itself. Um, and if you're looking for a job in big data, well, you know, I'm sure you can figure out how to contact me.
Um, so, the, you know, it's been seven years of, of Python development, and, and the things that I'm um, really interested in right now are much the same problems. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm still very much a, a, a Python person, you know, at my, um, at my core. Um, but I'm very interested in fostering collaboration amongst all of the data science programming languages. I think they're, it's the kind of, you know, R versus Python versus Julia, like the, you know, the data science language wars is very counterproductive and I think has impeded progress in, in certain ways. Um, and I would like to see collaboration in, um, I would like to see collaboration among those groups of people because we are solving the same problems, the same machine learning problems, the same analytics, you know, data serialization, you know, network database problems. Um, and if we could build toolkits that we could all, all use, uh, particularly for the same kinds of problems that Panda solves, um, that would be a, you know, a great benefit for the, for the future. Um, as long as there's a first class Python interface, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, and the, the other things related, or related to that is, is generally making um, Python, using Python for big data a lot better because I work at a big data company. Uh, so I'm working on that right now. And um, you know, I think the whole uh, LLVM, you know, JIT compiling code generation stuff, um, I believe that is the future of a lot of what we are doing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm putting my chips in that, uh, in, in that pile. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, hoping for like a no JVM future. I don't know if, I'll, if we'll ever see it, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, LLVM and JVM living in perfect harmony would be, would be really exciting. Um, and so the other, uh, the other kind of broad theme of what I'm working on is that, uh, you know, as, as the data gets bigger, um, invariably the storage and, and execution, you know, how the data gets processed and how, how it gets stored um, are going to be, you know, for really big data, um, are going to be, you know, standalone systems for storage and data processing. And the, and the question then becomes, how can you build the best user interface? Um, and I think, and I think a lot of, a lot of you should think that um, the, the Python is, you know, um, you know, the best or one of the best user interfaces for doing scientific computing, data processing, you know, all these problems that we're solving. Um, so making sure that we can continue to program in Python and that, you know, Python is, you know, viewed as one of the best environments for getting, getting work done. Um, that's, you know, uh, that's what I'm, what I'm working on and, uh, and I think I will continue to for quite some time. So I, uh, I ran slightly long and I don't think I have any time, f I don't know if I have time for questions, but uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, looking forward to what the, what the future holds. <laughs>